Well, I'm delighted to welcome as my special guest this week to Luck on Sunday, the chair of the British Horse Racing Authority. With an illustrious background in sport and sports administration, she has competed at Olympic level for England, for the UK, and has also been one of the sport's most important administrators. Anne-Marie Phelps, welcome. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. And great to have you here. I'm sure you were listening to that conversation with great oh, interest yes, between, the, between <laughs> Philip Davis and Neil Channing. And yeah. I suppose it just goes to show occasionally what an unwieldy beast horse racing can mm. be. Coming from a background in rowing and, and professional sport yourself, how have you found it so far? Um, well, A, I think it's fantastic sport. I love it. Um, it's a fantastic product. It's full of wonderful people who are incredibly passionate. But it is complex. There oh. are more stakeholders in this sport than I think I've seen in any other sport, including sports that have, you know, multiple disciplines. Um, and, and so there's a lot of chairmen, there's a lot of chief execs, there's a lot of committees, there's a lot of working groups, you know, and it does add complexity. And we, we try to simplify it down to a tripartite system where we've got the BHA, the horsemen and the race courses. Actually, just look at the horsemen on their own. You know, it, it's an incredibly complex sort of network of people who work for each other, who mm -hmm. are reliant on each other, and, you know, sometimes they agree and sometimes they don't agree, and that's, that's fine, that's natural. Are you by nature a, uh, a conciliatory? I hope so. Boss, <laughs> chair. I hope so. I hope, my, my view is that, you know, we will only make progress if we do things together. Whatever sport and whatever sector we're working in, and there's a wonderful African saying about if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together or mm -hmm. something. I'm paraphrasing. You know, but if we want to take the sport forward, we actually do have to work together and, and be unified in some way. And, and we've seen that. We've seen when racing makes real progress over things like the levy and the big change there a few years ago. That was done with everybody working together, with everybody on message, with everybody driving it and accepting there's going to be some change. Take me back to the beginning and where your interest in in racing began. I know you had a you had a, a casual interest in racing mm. through a, through a flatmate early on, didn't you? Yeah. So my my very good friend, um, still my best friend, uh, her father owned National Hunt Horses, um, and so all the way through my sort of university and then early twenties, um, we followed their various horses. The most famous of whom I hope that um, she won't mind me saying was Little Paul Vier, mm. who Mike, her father, famously sold six weeks before the Grand National oh, when it won. Word. So. Uh, so we lived through that sort of mm. highs and lows, but um, so I so probably that was the first real introduction to going to races. Uh -huh. um, but my family are all Irish. We have a family farm, um, livestock was dairy now livestock in uh, Wexford. You know, racing's never far away from mm. the you know the Irish background either. And you know, growing up, racing was on television every weekend. It was always on. So it's always sort of been there in the peripheries. I, I've been racing occasionally throughout my life as a goer, race mm -hmm. goer. I, I wouldn't say I was a committed race goer or massive racing fan, but I really enjoy the sport. But it's as a former professional athlete turned serious sports administrator yeah. where your skills and expertise are required. Having competed to Olympic level, having been a world champion rower, um, does that give you empathy with the with the stakeholders, with the participants involved with the sport? Do you think? Um, probably less than you'd think. Um, well, no, that, that's, that's unfair. The empathy, yes, probably less in terms of understanding mm -hmm. and experience. So I don't suppose that my experience as a rowing athlete at 1996 Olympic Games really is going to help me to understand, you know, whether Altior's ready to race or not, for example. <laughs> It, certainly as an ex-lightweight rower, I have real empathy with some yes. of the jockeys making weight. I really understand the importance of nutrition, the importance of fitness and all of those sorts of things. I do understand the pressures, sort of mental pressure of uh, competing day in and day out. And, and some empathy with, with trainers in terms of trying to uh, prepare their athletes. And they've got, they've got double, <laughs> double the athletes, I suppose, um, for a big race and how we get there. But how they do that is completely different. How trainers train horses and how... Jürgen Grobler, for example, trains the men's eight yeah. for the Olympic Games. is a very different process, reliant on some similar things, some similar techniques, but, but actually they're, they're quite different. But Horses is, are unique. Is that notion, I mean, when, you're, when you're a professional rower, is that notion of you being fitter, more driven, more pushed to the extremes than almost any mm. other athlete, is that, is that real? Is that true? Or is that just the perception we have from the no, outside? No, it's, it's really real. It is, yeah. It is really real. You're so totally focused. And I think from that perspective, you can compare something like rowing and racing mm -hmm. because, you know, once you're in the bubble, 
you are totally sort of blinkered and you know cons thinking about what you're doing day to day you, know, you can almost ignore the outside world to a certain extent and coming up to an Olympic Games for example our athletes will turn off their social media they will stop sort of engaging with outside influences to a great extent and really just focus on them and their preparation and their so you know they they do go into that bubble and and racing is uh, not to say it's a closed sport mm -hmm. but it is very sort of um, sort of inward inward looking almost very very focused on the multiple stakeholders that it's got in preparing and, and doing things because it's a relentless life. It goes on and on. And I, I hadn't appreciated, I don't think, the relentlessness of the racing yeah. calendar until I'd seen it happening. I suppose one of the things I was getting at is that now your board, your your BHA board, is mm. supposed to be more representative of, of the stakeholders and has is, is gone away from being fully in, independent again. If you have representatives from the, the trainers and the owners, mm not banging their fist on the table, but getting very cross and irate and um, being quite vexed about something, you can sometimes understand why their, their focus is mm. narrow, but presumably it's your job to then broaden their focus a little bit. How, how easy do you find that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, first, first and foremost, I say that the, the people on the board are not representative of anybody because as a board director, mm. they're there for the BHA and their fiduciary duty but they're representative the of various... They, they are yeah. bringing... They're, they're nominated yeah. by their members. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we have... Um, somebody from the Race Horse Owners Association. We have Luca Kamani, who's an ex-trainer, and their job is to bring their experience of mm -hmm. their past uh, lives and careers to the table to help us to make the right decisions and the best decisions um, from it. But I would say on that also that our independent directors, so-called independent directors, all have a an interest or a background in racing of some sort. I mean, we have people like Andrew Merriam is, you know, who's an ex-senior steward of yeah. the Jockey Club, who's an ex. Um, Steward, who brings vast experience as well, who's an owner, breeder, you know, uh, and it goes, it goes along, you know, and all of our independents have some sort of tie into the sport or some interest in the sport. But is it, is it, your, is it your job to try and make them think more, more laterally, perhaps? You talked about the, the insularity of racing in the racing bubble. Um, is it my yes it is and and it's the bhas as well to mm -hmm. to keep an eye on the outside i mean we've just you've just been talking to philip and you know it we have um uh, what i think is a very good lobbying group um uh, compared to other sports that i've seen who do test the temperature with government and with dcms and with defra quite often and we do have people who look outside it so we do try and keep an eye out both at executive level um but also at board level but but those independents on the board are also working in other industries quite often, so they will also bring that with them as well. And it's surprising, um, you know, how much even those people who are uh, member-nominated directors, if we can call them that, um, do actually then also bring other things with them, because we are there for the broad mm -hmm. good of the sport, and mm -hmm. so it's collective decision-making that we're trying to do. When, when you had been in situ for a couple of months, what did you think the sport as a whole needed to do better? What really struck you? Um, I think that what I would um, I'd really like to see is us focus a little bit more on talking to each other instead of necessarily always outward to the media when there's something that goes wrong. Um, I think probably the one thing that I want to focus on is ensuring that uh, people in the sport have the proper representation and the right forum in which to uh -huh. bang the table. Um, uh, and that's to do with the structure and how that's working and we'll, we're working on that. So just explain that a bit more to me. So, we, so uh, most of our main stakeholders sit around a, a meeting table called the Members Committee. Mm -hmm. Um, that meets a few times a year and actually what we really need to do is to make sure that's working properly, that people are properly represented and that we help um, each of those stakeholders to be communicating properly with their membership so that we really do have a, a good channel for communication mm -hmm. um, and that's what I, I think is probably the thing I'd like to see happen most of all because if we can make sure that we're talking to people and they're being heard and we can explain properly the decisions that are being made and why we're making them that has to take us together in the right direction if we do want to move forward as i say we, one of the things we want to do is increase money coming into the sport for example you know we're only going to do that if we work together the bha is judged as a governor but also and more frequently on a day-to-day -day basis judged as a regulator. Yeah. How would you judge its performance as a regulator in the last 12 months? 
Um, I think that we've got some really committed and passionate people there. Um, we've got some real expertise and as everyone will know we're going through a process of reviewing what that regulation looks like and how we deliver it. Um, so there's been a lot of changes around, particularly around the stewarding model. Mm -hmm. Um, we're constantly revising and reviewing matters around um, anti-doping matters in, in equine uh, athletes. Now that, that's an area you'll have had quite a significant experience of with rowing and the, the Olympics. How yes. do you think we do? I, I think we do very well actually and I think if I, coming from the outside, our, our capacity and our capability as a regulator is gold standard actually and it's viewed like that across other sports. So I do quite a lot of work in um, sports integrity, speak at conferences on sports integrity, people always say you know, that they would all like to be more like the BHA in terms of their regulation. So of course we're not going to please everybody and of course there are going to be mistakes and of course there are going to be times when, when we're challenged. But if we were a regulator that everybody loved then we wouldn't be doing our job properly. You know, If suddenly the, everyone liked the FCA you could bet your bottom dollar that they weren't really regulating banking properly, for example. Yeah. So there has to be a certain tension. and um, People don't have to love the regulatory bit, but, but we do need to get to a point and we need to continue to review and to continue to work on our approach to that um, and make sure that we're at, at least respected for our regulation. As chair, is it part of your job to give the executive the confidence to regulate without, without fear of backlash? To say, go on, if that's what you think's right, mm. go on and do it. It is, but it's equally my role as chair and our role as a board to make sure that we are asking pertinent questions and challenging them when things come through. So mm. is this the right time for this? Are we doing it in the right way? Have we communicated it in the, in the correct manner? Have we given people time to adjust? Those are the sorts of questions that we need to be asking and pushing against. And you know, it, you know how, how are we communicating it? How are we helping people to understand what it is they need to do? What that we expect of them to do differently, as well. So I don't. I think we, you know, we can do things better. Our approach can be better. We probably need to be a little bit more pragmatic, more focused on, you know, what I don't want us to do is to catch people out because they've made mistakes. What we're trying to do is to regulate the sport to give people confidence mm -hmm. in the results, to give people confidence that when they invest and they buy a horse, that they're actually going to get what they see. So those are, those are our things, we, you know, always go back to why are we doing this, what are our values, we're trying to create a fair, open, transparent sport that, you know, is prosperous and has a, a sustainable future. And transparent and prosperous not only for people who invest in the sport through ownership, yep. but people who are investing their money in the sport by betting on it every Absolutely. day, which is a, such a key yep. driver of, of financing the sport. And it, it struck me when I read your, your Jim, Jim Crack speak, speech, much of which you've, you've touched on here, how far down the piece betting came and I wonder going back to Philip Davis's point whether racing isn't quite sure of its own relationship with betting at the moment and doesn't really know the way in which it wish, wishes to present that relationship. I, I, think, I think Philip made some really good points. I think that we are very cognizant of the importance of betting to the sport um, but what we need to do as the BHA from a governing body perspective is to try and ensure that we have a really robust and resilient sport, mm -hmm. that our base is sustainable and then to build on that by trying to look for ways to increase revenues. So our relationship with the betting industry is critical, that's why we've got the Betting Liaison Forum, um, it's why we've reached out and are working with the, bet the new Betting and Gaming Council and one of the first um, things I did when I heard that Bridget Simmons had been, um, uh, had been appointed to the chair of that was to write and say, you know, we'd love to work with you. I think that we have a lot to offer to the betting industry. Yes, we're reliant on them. Yes, they're critical to us. But we need to be able to get to a point where we're not so reliant on them that, you know, when they have fluctuations in revenues that we fall apart. You know, we need to find other ways of having revenue in. Now, the commercial aspects are not what the BHA does. So our role is to make sure that that integrity piece and the confidence piece is what people have. And then, then perhaps to work with uh, the betting industry to try and help them to develop, you know, socially responsible products, um, to help them to tell the story about what's good about betting. You know, it is a, a totally legitimate leisure pursuit for many people. Yes, there are dangers around it. Yes, we don't, you know, we're not going to deny that, that there are people that get addicted and, and there are some mm. bad aspects to it. But what the levy does in terms of um, 
sort of helping to support our rural economy, helping to support uh, thou tens of thousands of people in jobs across the industry, in helping to make our the green lung of England, you know, those wonderful traditional heritage parts of our whole nation, actually, um, uh, very strong, is really important. And I think there's a really good news story around that in the same way that the National Lottery talks about the good causes. You know, the levy is really helping to, yeah. to create and sustain rural economies and for I our country. And I think that is something that we haven't really played up at all. And that's yeah. why we can be confident of pushing betting a bit further toward the middle and say, yes, you can bet on this yeah. with some confidence while res respecting the idea of uh, problem gambling. L let me just talk about the, the relationship between the BHA and and the trainers, which mm. certainly over the last year it struck me has become quite adversarial. And we've mm. seen it most recently in in the the issue about apprentices and the division of the mm. the division of money that they receive. What was your reaction to the comments made this week by by Andrew Balding and before that by Richard Fahey, who you you name checked in your Jim Crack yeah. speech quite positively? Yes, he, and was, I, and I've, he I've, was probably within bread roll throwing <laughs> distance. <laughs> well, I've met them both, and I've been to both of their yards, and I think they're both incredibly they're both incredible trainers and very nice people. Um, I think it's uh, it's really disappointing from a BHA perspective that they feel the way they do. Um, I think the media have actually focused a lot on the people like like that that have, have a problem with it and less so on you know the the number of trainers who've actually been supportive of this move and I think that you know we have to look at the, not necessarily the, this sort of this reaction but actually w go back to why we um, wanted to make this mm -hmm. change actually it wasn't the BHA that wanted to make the change um, the PJA the the Professional Jockeys Association came to us um, to say that you know explaining that they'd had an awful lot of people raising this uh, issue that the 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 uh, the agreement that was in place um, they and the NTF I think both agreed wasn't fit for purpose at the time it wasn't being followed and there were a significant number of trainers who were not paying their apprentice jockeys uh, expenses so there's a, a significant number of, of young apprentice jockeys out there um, I know people have said that they're not vulnerable, but but actually they are. There's a there's very much a power relationship between their trainer and these young people coming into the sport at that age, um, and uh, the the negotiations between the NTF and the PJA went on for a very long time. Neither of them could come to a compromise or an agreement, and so finally, uh, what was the nearest to the compromise? And and let's remember, this is only bringing us back somewhere close to where conditionals are mm -hmm. um, was sent to the, to the board of the BHA to arbitrate on effectively because no decision could be made um, by those two two organizations so we've made the best decision we did question it we sat and we discussed it for a very long time we, we you know we pushed back very much on both sides of the argument um, and decided to approve this and the timing of it to give people a bit of time to get used to it um, and, and I can see that you know there are some people that have built their their business models on this. Um, you know, they do give an awful lot to the apprentice jockeys they've got. But likewise, there are a significant number who are not looking after them in the same way. And it's always a shame when that happens. But those are the people we should be focusing on. No, not on the BHA trying to make sure that we're looking after our young people coming in the sport. But surely a compromise, if indeed there could be a compromise, would be to punish the people who were not abiding by the regulations you lay down, i.e. not paying their apprentices the requisite mm. share of their, their expenses, but not to, um, not to penalise, as they would see it, the trainers who've been abiding by the, by the rules. But what we're doing is trying to move this closer to where the conditionals are at the moment. We're not doing something you know, that's completely different. And, you know, we have to move towards 21st century employment practices and things as well. We, you know, we can't live always in the past. I was getting a definite whiff from some of the comments that were made that there was a feeling within the BHA that this was a bit Victorian workhousey. some of the way that apprentices were employed. Is that something you'd agree with? Um, I don't know that I'd call it Victorian workhouse, but there is certainly a power imbalance always between young people coming in and, and powerful trainers. And the fact that very few people have come forward openly to say my trainer isn't giving me this money you know they're going through the PJA they don't feel they're able to fight mm. it through the trainers so you know we need to just make it a bit more simple we need to make the agreement more transparent and easier for people to see that it was being done in the right way. Just last point for the moment and I know you're going to stay with us today in the Racing Post it was announced that the BHA mm. are going to um, try and 
recoup the £600,000 debt that exists at the moment and, and push that cost out onto, onto race courses and, more significantly perhaps, to, to owner's administration costs. How can you square the idea of raising owner's administration costs when prize money is falling? Um, so I, I wouldn't say that we're recouping 600000 entirely through that um, rise in our fees. Actually, the fee rise is largely to do with the fact that our biggest contracts around equine welfare, do doping testing, um, racing admin um, costs and things like that go up in line with inflation year mm -hmm. on year. So this is largely to do with our costs are going up. The reason that we can't absorb it is because we've had a couple of huge costs in the past, which mean that we're not able to do that. We are also cutting costs internally, so we've looked very, very hard at cutting expenses, um, cutting other areas of admin within the organisation to try and save money and are trying to save money that way as well. So it's really just a rebalancing. It is, all, it, it, you know, it isn't right. We'd, we wouldn't like. We would love to not be putting things mm. up, but it's better that we go up gradually year by year than we suddenly find ourselves having to put up, you know, a, a three or three and a half percent or four percent in three years' time because we haven't increased fees on a gradual basis. Um, for the moment, Anna Marie, thank you very much. I know you're going to stay with us, and Emma and uh, and Philip are going to come back. So hopefully you will uh, stay with us as well. But uh, our special guest, Anna Marie Phelps, is uh, is going nowhere for the moment. I hope you don't either. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.